Welcome, good morning church, in person and online. I'm glad you're with us. I love church. I was telling the team prior to, prior to beginning the service, I just said I love church. I mean, you may have already figured that out by now. But I mean, I, I love the church, the body of Christ, and the local expression of it here at Word Life. But I just love Sunday morning church. And uh, so I'm just happy as I can be to be here. <laughs> um, so during Advent and Christmas here at Word of Life, we are looking at songs of Messiah. It's, it's a season of song, and we're examining the songs that we find in Scripture that inform our understanding of Messiah. And this Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent, we're going to look at Mary's song, the Magnificat as it's known. But before we look at Mary's song, we need to spend a little bit of time and talk about Mary herself. Now, not only is Mary, the mother of Jesus, the most significant woman in the salvation story, I think we can say that aside from Jesus, Mary is the most significant person in the story of the history of salvation. I mean, yes, there's, there's Abraham, the patriarch of faith. There's Moses, the deliverer and lawgiver. There's David, the sweet psalmist of Israel and the archetype of a righteous king. There's Elijah, the prototypical prophet. There's the apostles, Peter and Paul. But it's through Mary that the word becomes flesh. Amen. And that's a big deal, folks. That's a big deal. It's through Mary that the word becomes flesh. The, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. David Bentley Hart translates that. The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. And it's, how does the logos, how does the, the logos become flesh? It's through the flesh of Mary. It's Mary that gives her flesh that the Son of God might become incarnate. So not only is Mary, aside from Jesus, the most significant person in the salvation story, Mary is also a great mystery. And the more we think about Mary, the more mysterious she becomes. I mean, have you ever, have you ever spent any time just contemplating this, that, that Mary conceived in her womb the Son of God? That Mary gave birth to the Son of God? That Mary nursed upon her breast the very Son of God? That Mary nurtured and raised into adolescence and adulthood, the Son of God. Now, along with all of us, Mary calls Jesus her Savior. But Mary alone can also call Jesus her Son. How great is that mystery? Now, this is the mystery of Mary as the Theotokos. That's a theological term, a Greek term. Uh, it means God-bearer. God-bearer, because she bore in her womb very God of very God who became flesh and joined us in our humanity. Um, when I visit Orthodox churches, as I do from time to time, in every Orthodox church I've been in, you will see at the front of the church, sometimes on the dome, but at the front of the church you will see what they call... Um, the sign of the Theotokos, you'll see that. And when I first started visiting churches, Orthodox churches, they were mostly uh, not here, not in this country. Maybe in the Middle East or Russia or other places. Uh, but the first time I visited an Orthodox church in America, I, I saw what had always been in some language I didn't know in English. And I saw that phrase, more spacious than the heavens. I had no idea what that meant. But, I, but it intrigued me. I thought, huh, there's got to be something to that. I don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> but more spacious than the heavens, what does that mean? And I, uh, I found out. It actually comes from a liturgy written by St. Basil the Great around the year 370. 
And it's in reference to the womb of Mary. Now, how could you speak of the womb of Mary as more spacious than the heavens? Because in her womb, she conceived the one, the one who created the heavens and the earth and fills the heavens and the earth. And yet, this one comes and dwells in her womb, more spacious than the heavens. I think we can say it like this. It's by the incarnation through the Theotokos that God enters into and participates in creation in order to save creation. Amen. So Mary's a big deal. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't think we have Protestants here of the ilk that get nervous about that. If not, it's time for you to get over it. So, um, as important as Mary is, though, with this, as important as she is in the in the salvation story, she only speaks four times in Scripture. Uh, she speaks during the Annunciation. We'll look at that in a moment. She gives her song. Of course, we're going to look at that too. She speaks. To Jesus, she's recorded as speaking to Jesus when Jesus was 12 and remember he disappeared for three days and was in the temple and Mary was not actually happy about that. <laughs> and she, when she found him, you know, there's that moment of anxiety that turns to relief, that turns to frustration. <laughs> and she said, child, why have you treated us this way? Uh, so you hear her speak there. And then the final time you hear her speak is at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. When she makes the observation to her son Jesus, they have no wine. And then a little bit later, Mary says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And this is the prompt for Jesus to work his first miracle and turn the water to wine. Now this morning, I want us though to take a closer look at the Annunciation and Mary's song. In our gospel reading that we just heard, um, we heard of the angel Gabriel's announcement to Mary that she would conceive a child that would be called Jesus. Now this week as I meditated on the 13 verses that tell the story of Gabriel's announcement to Mary, I was struck by how many names appear. It's only 13 verses long, it's not very long. But there are nine names in those 13 verses, and some of them are used more than once. Uh, there are the names of two places, one angel and six people. So the places that are named are Galilee and Nazareth. The angel that is named is Gabriel. And the people who are named are Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth, Jacob, David, and Jesus. This profusion of names in the announcement of the birth of Jesus, uh, stresses that salvation is not abstract or extent merely in the realm of thought, but salvation is historical. In other words, the salvation story is full of the names of people and places because God is deeply involved in human history. So we could say it like this. The angel Gabriel comes to Nazareth in Galilee to tell the Virgin Mary, the fiance of Joseph and the cousin of Elizabeth, that she will give birth to a son named Jesus who will be the son of David and will reign over the house of Jacob. So now, let's go to Galilee. We're going to Galilee right there in between the, the B.C. and the year of our Lord, first century. We're going to go to Nazareth in Galilee, which is a village about 100 miles north of Jerusalem. Today, Nazareth is almost exactly the same population as St. Joseph. It's 77,000. But in Jesus' day, it was a small village of no more than a few hundred people. Now, in this village... In Galilee, named Nazareth, there lives a Jewish girl by the name of Miriam. She's named after Moses' sister, Miriam. We know her as Mary. Uh, she's a teenager, so don't think of a, of a woman in her 20s. Think of a teenager, most likely. She's a teenager, and she's devout. 
She's a devout, observant Jew. She keeps Torah. She goes to the synagogue every Sabbath. She knows the prayers. She knows the scriptures. But she's not just observant. It comes from a place of purity, a pure heart. She loves God. She worships God. And she is waiting for God to act. She's waiting for God to do what the prophets said that God would do and send an anointed king to sit upon the throne of David to set right all that had gone wrong. This devout Jewish girl named Miriam is engaged to a man named Joseph. He's a carpenter, a tecton. You know, there's not much wood there to work with. He works more with stone, but we call him a carpenter. And she's engaged to Joseph, and they are to be married, but they are not yet married. They have not yet been together. Now, our story unfolds during the Roman occupation of Judea, which was particularly brutal in Galilee. Perry and I in recent years have taken to spending a little more time in Nazareth when we are there in the Holy Land. And uh, just back in early March before our pilgrim group arrived, we had a couple of days that we stayed in Nazareth and got to explore the place even more deeply than we have in times past. And we found that there are several new archaeological excavations going on in Nazareth, exploring the time of Jesus. And what they've learned is that many of the homes from the time of Jesus in Nazareth had secret hidden compartments for storing food. They weren't just, you know, storage bins. They were, you know, underneath false floors and things like that. And that tells us a lot about the time that they were living in. That that the Romans were prone to just come in and take everything. And so the people were, out of necessity, were having to be creative and come up with secret hiding places for their, for their food. So the, the, it, life is not tranquil and easy. The city nearby Nazareth was Sepphoris, just four miles away. And it was a city that was, had both a Jewish and a Roman population. And right around the time of our story, there was a Jewish revolt, an uprising against the Roman occupation that began in Sepphoris, just four miles from Nazareth. And what was the result of this Jewish uprising against the Roman occupation in Sepphoris was 2,000 Jewish men were crucified by the Romans. That's happening as our little teenage girl, Miriam, is living four miles away in Nazareth. So indeed, life in Galilee was not tranquil. It was hard and dangerous. And then an angel sent by God, by the name of Gabriel, comes to Miriam or Mary. And the angel says, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And then the angel says, oh, I forgot to say this. Don't be afraid. <laughs> They always say that first, but Gabriel knew how big a message this was, and he was excited to get into it. And oh, yeah, don't be afraid. <laughs> and uh, the angel went on to explain You're going to conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Yahshua, Joshua, Jesus. The name means the salvation of Yahweh. And this son that you're going to give birth to will sit upon the throne of his father David, which means he's going to be the Messiah, the one they'd all been waiting for. Miriam, like everybody else, was waiting for a Messiah to come. She, she probably hardly ever dreamed that she would be his mother, and certainly not under the circumstances that the angel is explaining to her. So she says, well, well how can this be? I've not had intimacy with a man. I'm a virgin. How can this be? The angel says, oh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. Therefore, the thing that is conceived within you will be called the Son of God. 
To which Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to your word. That's the most famous thing that Mary ever said. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be unto me according to your word. That's the story of the Annunciation, the announcement. That's what Annunciation means. The announcement of Gabriel to the Virgin Mary that she would give birth to to Christ, to Messiah. Now, the Annunciation is the second most depicted event in Christian art, second only to the crucifixion of Christ. The Annunciation was an especially popular theme in medieval and Renaissance art. In the medieval and Renaissance Annunciations, Mary is depicted as a lady of the nobility. Here's an example. This is, uh, this is from 1483. This is none other than Leonardo da Vinci, his Annunciation. Uh, this is in Florence. Perry and I have seen this. And the first thing I want to say about this, this is just a dang impressive piece of art. I mean, this is, you know, this is Leonardo da Vinci. And it's, it's beautiful. It's a tremendous artistic achievement. But as you look at it, you don't really get the idea that this woman here, depicted as a lady of the aristocracy, is living a hard and dangerous life. That's, that's not the idea you get. Uh, she doesn't look like a Jewish teenage girl living in occupied Galilee where they have to hide food and they're crucifying people all around her. In fact, she looks like what she's depicted as. She's not, I mean, she is a Roman. <laughs> when she's an Italian lady of the nobility is how she's depicted. So it's a great work of art, but I don't think it gets us, you know, where we're trying to understand. So in 1898, as we begin to move more into modernity, uh, Tanner, what's his, what's his whole name? I got to check out my notes here. Uh, Henry Oswald Tanner, famous, famous painter. Henry Oswald Tanner painted his Annunciation. Uh, this is in the, you'll find it in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. I've not seen it, but I hope to someday. And I like this one. Uh, it's very different. It, this is simple, rustic. She, she totally looks like a teenager to me. And you, 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 uh, you look at her and you go, no, she is not a member. She is not a, label, a, a lady in the nobility, in the aristocracy. It's rustic. It's simple. I mean, go ahead and contrast the two. I mean, we have Tanner and then we have Da Vinci. <laughs> yeah, that's, there we go. We'll stick with that one for a little bit. Because it's as we look upon Tanner's depiction of the Annunciation that now perhaps we are ready to hear Mary's song, traditionally known as the Magnificat because it's her magnifying the Lord. So the Magnificat, or Mary's song, goes like this. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is His name. He has mercy on those who fear Him in every generation. He has shown the strength of His arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich He has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. That's the song of Mary. That's the most words you're going to hear from Mary, is that song. Now, the first thing maybe to know about Mary's song is that it is an adaptation of of a much earlier song. Backing up, let's see. Oh, I can't, I haven't, I can't do the math in my head. Uh, 
uh, yeah, like 1,100 years. Thank you, Perry. Like, we'll just round it off, say more than 1,000 years earlier, there was a similar song known as Hannah's song. Hannah was the mother of the prophet Samuel. He was the prophet. He was also the last judge of Israel. He's the one that then is the segue moment from the judges to the kings. Hannah was the mother of the prophet Samuel. She had been unable to conceive a child, which brought much sorrow into her life. But she then was able to conceive a child after making a vow to dedicate this child to the Lord. And this is the birth of Samuel, ask of the Lord. That's his name. Now, after Hannah brought the child when he was two or three to serve with Eli in the temple, although I'm not sure how much help a two-year-old would be in the temple, but whatever. Uh, after she brought her child to Eli the priest there in Shiloh to serve in not the temple, but in the, in the tabernacle, uh, she bursts forth in this song. Here's part of it. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth boasts over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no holy one like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He makes them sit with princes. And so that's the inspiration for Mary's song. And we again see how the New Testament is dependent upon the Old Testament, that the Second Testament is dependent upon the First Testament. Now what stands out in both Hannah and Mary's songs is how revolutionary they are. These are, these are dangerous songs. These are songs that in the, you know, in the wrong circumstance can get you put in jail or something like that. These are definitely not the kind of songs sung by the ladies of the aristocracy. They don't sing those kind of songs. A slightly revolutionary woman might sing this song. Again, from Mary's song, think about this. Now just, just, just pull back a little bit and just think, okay, it's a time of Roman occupation. The Jewish people are oppressed. They are deliberately kept in poverty while Rome is enriched by what is happening. And not just Rome, but, you know, all of those that are in collusion with them. So the Herods of the world and, you know, the Sadducees and that whole temple apparatus that is getting rich in the midst of such great suffering of the Jewish people. Her song says, he has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones. I mean, oh, wait a minute now. I mean, there's only, there's only one person in, in, in Judea that sits upon a throne, and that's Herod. That's a, that's a direct shot at Herod. And Herod will strike back. You know, you know that story. For he has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Well, the principalities and powers are never going to sing a song like that. Mary's song says that on the day that the Almighty does his thing, the mighty are cast down and the lowly are lifted up. It's a, it's a reversal of fortunes. The hungry are filled and the rich are sent away empty. The proud and the mighty and the rich lose out while the humble and the hungry and the lowly have their day. And this is exactly what Jesus says after Jesus is born and he grows up, you know, adolescence, adulthood, and then finally baptism and begins his ministry in his 30s. This is exactly what Jesus says when he first introduces the kingdom of God in the Sermon on the Mount. How does he begin? What is the first beatitude? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, when we hear Hannah's song, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes. When, when we hear Mary's song, 
He has cast down the mighty from the thrones, lifted up the lowly, filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. When we hear Jesus' beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, or blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When we hear Hannah's song, Mary's song, Jesus' beatitudes, we know what we need to do, right? Well, what we need to do is we need to humble ourselves and sit in the impoverished place of our lives. Somebody says, well, well I'm, not, I'm not poor. I said, well, you, you, you may not be poor if we look at your bank account, but I, I assume you can find some area in your life where you are impoverished and that's where you need to go sit. That's where you need to live into a little bit because when we humble ourselves and sit in the impoverished places in our lives, um, this is what Hannah calls the ash heap. The ash heap, you know, where the dreams have gone up in smoke, where you don't have strength, where you're not rich, as it were. When we sit in the ash heap, Hannah says that that's when God will come and lift you up and sit you with the princes. But if you say, if you say like the Laodicean said in the book of Revelation, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, what does Jesus say? Well, I'm just going to puke at that. <laughs> you look it up. It's in Revelation 3. It's basically what he says. I mean, almost literally. He said, well, that just makes me want to puke. That you, you don't, you're rich and increased with gain and you have need of nothing. Well, then I have nothing to offer you. So that's why we, we identify the places in our life that are nice sheep, where we're broken, where we're hurting, where we're insufficient, where our strength is failing, and we go sit there. Because that's where God is going to come to. We sit in the ash sheep of our lives and we wait for God to come and reverse things. You know what this is? This is Advent. That's what Advent is. That's what Advent is all about. Advent is about not just waiting. I mean, it is waiting. We are waiting. But it's not just about waiting, but it's about waiting in the right places. We identify the places in our lives where we are poor, weak, broken, and insufficient. If you've got a lot of money, it isn't that area. It isn't that area. But there must be some area where you can say, I'm impoverished in this area. I need God to help me. Certainly, you're never going to say, oh, God, I'm pretty much rich and increasing in goods and have need of nothing. No, you're going to say, I have these areas of insufficiency, of weakness, of poverty. And you go sit there. You go, you find the ash sheep. Anybody, anybody know you've got an ash sheep in your life? You go sit there. This is your week. You've got an ash sheep, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie's been through a house fire. He's got like a literal ash sheep. Just go over there and sit there and... You know, and wait for God to show up. Amen. <laughs> that just made my sermon. That's great. <laughs> and it's good that you laugh about it and joke about it. That's good. Amen. So we identify the ash sheep. We go sit there. That's what we do during Advent. We identify the places in our life where we are poor and weak, broken and insufficient. And we wait there. We wait for Jesus to come and lift us up. But we wait in hope. I mean, the ash sheep is the place where almost all hope is gone. Almost, but not all hope. Almost. Almost all hope is gone, but not all hope because of whom we are waiting for. We're waiting for Jesus. And because it's Jesus we wait for, we know that he will come. And as the song of Mary says, he has come to the help of his servant Israel. For he has remembered his promise of mercy the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, help us to identify where we're weak, where we can be meek, that we might inherit what it is you want to bring us and give us and do for us. Lord, let us never be like the lukewarm and Arrogant Laodiceans who said, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And they knew not that they were wretched, poor, blind, miserable, and naked. Lord, help us to identify the areas of our life that are nice sheep. 
where our own strength is insufficient, where we don't have it together. Lord, help us to find those areas. And then we go and we sit there. And Jesus, we wait for you to come and lift us up, to seat us with the princes of your people. Lord, we can't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps when we're in the ash heap, so we wait for you. And we trust that you will come and you will rescue and you will help and you will heal, you will deliver. We sit in the ash heap, we sit in the places of poverty and we wait for you, Jesus, and we wait with hope because we know that those that wait upon the Lord renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not, and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. We thank you, Lord, that new strength is coming to us because you will come to us and lift us up. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Stand with me and we'll come to the table of the Lord and indeed we will find strength there. Join with me in praying. Um, well, join with me and let's begin by confessing our Christian faith and uh, maybe, maybe you'll particularly hear the part about born of the Virgin Mary because we've heard that story today. Join with me in confessing Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let's make our confession of sin and receive the forgiveness of the Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility, ask for mercy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven.